All right, so today we're diving into a story, and you know how everyone loves a good comeback story, right? Yeah. A country pulling itself up, turning things around, and that's what we're looking at today, Nigeria. Yeah. They've been making, like, some seriously bold economic reforms. Yeah. But, um... Not everyone's convinced. Not everyone's convinced. Yeah. It's all sunshine and rainbows. Right. Yeah. You've got, like, these big institutions. The World Bank is basically saying, look, these reforms are tough. I mean, no one's denying that. But if Nigeria sticks with it, give it, like, a decade, maybe 15 years, they'll come out stronger on the other side. Okay. They point to things like, um, you know, Nigeria shrinking its fiscal deficit. Right. So that's the difference between government spending and revenue from 6.2% yeah. last year down to 4.4% this year as a sign that, hey, things are moving in the right direction. Okay. So shrinking that deficit on paper sounds like a win. Right. But what does that actually look yeah. like for everyday people? Like what we're seeing from, you know, analysts in Vanguard News. Yeah. Like these Nigerian economists, financial experts are saying, Hold on a minute, like uh -huh. not so fast. They're really worried about the impact these reforms are having on people on the ground. Absolutely. It really is, you know, like kind of a classic case of the human side of economics, right? Yeah. Where you've got these, um, you know, the articles from Vanguard News bring up some really important concerns. Like, for example, Olatunde Amalegbe, he's a former president of the Chartered Institute of Stockbrokers. He argues that these reforms are hitting the most vulnerable Nigerians the hardest. And it's not just that they're being impacted. It's how, yeah. you know, Clifford Egbomiet, he's a public policy analyst, and he really lays it out there. He says removing fuel subsidies, which, again, might sound good if you're just looking at it from a pure economic standpoint, right. has caused transportation and food costs to skyrocket. He literally says that the removal of fuel subsidy a bitter pill to swallow, has worsened the people's plight with its attendant consequences on cost of transportation and food. Wow. Like, how are people supposed to afford to live, to eat? And that ties into another criticism we see um, from David Adonry. He's an analyst at High Cap Securities Limited. Okay. And he argues that these reforms are too focused on the demand side of the economy. So we're trying to control spending. But what about the supply side? What about making sure that there are enough goods and services to actually meet people's needs, even with these increased costs? So it's like saying, OK, everybody tighten your belts. Yeah, exactly. But there's no guarantee there's going to be food on the table. Right. It's like, how are you going to tighten it if there's nothing there? Exactly. So it feels like like we're talking about this really difficult balancing act. Yeah. Where you've got like these long term economic goals. Right. Which, OK, yeah, they're important. Right. But then you have people who are like struggling to afford food today. Mm. So what's the solution? What's the way forward? You hit the nail on the head. It's you need to find a path that's sustainable, right? You want it to work in the long term, but it also can't completely forget about the people who are struggling right now. And, you know, Egbo May, the public policy analyst that we talked about earlier. Um, yeah. He actually offers some like some interesting solutions, right? He stresses the importance of social safety nets. Oh. These are programs that are designed to help people when they when they fall on hard times. Yeah. So kind of like a safety net to catch people when things get rough. Exactly. To provide a financial cushion. Right. right. So that way, you know, they can they can get back on their feet. But he also says, in addition to that, you've got to focus on job creation. Right. Because in a perfect world, if everyone had access to a good paying job, then they wouldn't be as reliant on those safety nets in the first place. Right. But then, you know, he also says when aid is needed, it needs to be targeted. It needs to go directly to those who need it most. So not just like throwing money at the problem, but being really strategic about it. Yes, exactly. OK. And this brings up another, like, I think really critical question that Egbo Mead raises, which is, can Nigeria afford to wait 10 to 15 years right. for these reforms to fully play out without seeing any significant improvements in people's lives in the meantime? That's, I mean, that's the question, right? Yeah. Because it's easy for, like, you know, a big organization like the World Bank to say, oh, just be patient. Right. But it's the Nigerian people who are living with this every day. Exactly. That's that's really the crux of it, right? There's yeah. no there's no easy answer, and it really kind of forces you to think about your priorities. Absolutely, it makes you really consider. Like, if you were advising, you know, the Nigerian government, what would your priority be? Right. Would it be we're sticking to this long term plan, no matter how tough it gets? Yeah. Or is it okay? We need to figure out how to like 
make life a little bit easier for people today. Right. And there's a lot to unpack there. Absolutely. And that's what makes these deep dives so important because these aren't just like, you know, abstract economic theories, right? These are policies that have very real consequences for real people. It's a really complex issue with no easy answers. Yeah. This has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you for, for coming on. Um, Thank you for having me. And to all of you listening, if you want to go even deeper on this, on how these reforms are impacting the lives of Nigerians, you can visit us at whatsbuzzn.com for more information.